Praise God. I am excited, and I, <clears throat> I want to tell you, you're in for something awesome. The, the speaker today is a very close friend of mine. He and his wife, we've developed and forged a great relationship over the last, I think, eight years or maybe more. And uh, recently, I spoke up in the uh, Norton, Virginia, at a a conference filled with many pastors and church leaders. It was a celebration of Dr. Tom Renfro's miraculous healing. Dr. Tom is a medical doctor by profession, has a uh, several a uh, couple of clinics that he runs and uh, doctors over. His lovely wife has a rich, rich history of revival in the Appalachian Mountains. When her daddy was a little boy and her granddaddy was uh, running uh, probably illegal s distilleries, <laughs> they were bootlegging. And they had a visit by the real spirit. At a time of medical crisis and severe sickness, the spirit of God showed up in the Appalachian Mountains some of you may have heard about the rich revivals that have happened over the years in the Appalachian Mountains. But amongst these people that were harder than nails and more crooked than a bent nail, the Spirit of God showed up. Her grandpa got miraculously healed and started to move in the gift of healing. Her daddy had a vis an amazing visitation and all of his life moved in the ability to see accurately, prophetically, things in the spirit. Amazing stories, and some of you ladies were the beneficiaries of hearing the ministry from Pastor Sid Renfro yesterday. How many of you ladies enjoyed that yesterday? Come on, give her a big round welcome. Some of you are already familiar with what I'm about to say, but for those of you who don't know, Dr. Renfro should have been dead 25 years ago. He had reached the point where they had given him less than two weeks to live. His body was riddled with tumors, basketball-sized tumor in his belly and softball-sized tumors under his arms and in all various places. It is medically documented. It has been recorded through video and photos this man is a walking miracle. He did not get chemotherapy or anything like that. In fact, to keep him alive for Christmas, they gave him a baby dose of, of it, was chemo. it was chemo, a baby dose of chemo. A they, temporary. They, couldn't, they didn't want to give him more than a baby dose because it would kill him. They wanted to keep him alive. They were his friends, doctors, fellow doctors, wanted to keep him alive so he'd have one more Christmas. The church had been praying around the clock for days, and every tumor turned to water, and they literally had to flush this water out of his body. Absolutely miraculous. No scientific explanation whatsoever. This man is my dear friend, but better than that, he is God's dear friend as well. I want you to welcome with me Dr. Tom Renfro. Come on, church. Stand up and give him a warm welcome. I love you, buddy. I love you, Pastor. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Thank you, church, for the opportunity to be here, and it's good, so good, to be down here in Florida in warm weather and away from the mountains of Virginia for a time being. <laughs> I believe the Spirit of God moves warmer down here than he does back home. <laughs> We've had flooding again in eastern Kentucky and in southwest Virginia. We've had snow, and it's so good to be here with you all today. The Spirit of God is moving across this land, folks. Yeah. And you perhaps feel it, and I feel it, that God's wanting to do more in your life and more in your community, more in your home, more in your business than ever before. 
And as the Spirit of the Lord is sweeping across this land, get in the water. Just jump in and be a part of what God's doing here in this special time that He's chose to come and put His Spirit out in such a way that all can receive, that He can feel this hunger that's within us. I want to talk to you today about, about Naaman. And my scripture comes from 2 Kings 5 and 13. And I want you to dwell on what this servant, this unknown man said to a general, to a pagan general by the name of Naaman. And his servants came near and spoke unto him and said, My father... If the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then when he said to thee, Wash and be clean. Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh became like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Many of you all that are scholars that study the Word of God are very familiar with the story of the healing of the Syrian general of Naaman by the Word of the Lord that came through Elijah. But just to set the background, because I always want to find and set the background, set the stage of how this happened. It's now been around 140 years since the fracture of the nation of Israel. And it was fractured into two kingdoms. The ten northern kingdoms that was called Israel. That had its own capital Samaria. That had its own set of kings over the decades. And then the southern kingdom called Judah. That had its capital as Jerusalem. And had its own kings. And ever since that breakup some 140 years earlier. There had been wars and skirmishes and fights between the two nations, not only between the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, but with other nations as well. And there would be times that they would join together in a confederacy and come together against a kingdom. And then after that, they'd come against another kingdom. So all this fighting continued on. In Syria, which lies to the north of Israel, they had a particular problem with them. And the same thing that was going on then is going on even today. When a nation like Russia decides it wants to take over part of another nation and wage war and impose itself just like Russia is doing on Ukraine right now. Well, Syria was imposing itself intermittently on Israel. And they would come in with armies and they would take over cities and they would plunder the cities and they'd carry off the captives. And the man that was in charge of all this warfare was a general by the name of Naaman. And the rabbinic, the rabbinic literature relates that Naaman, for you scholars, was the one that the Bible said was the unknown man that actually shot an arrow in the sky and killed Ahab, a king of Israel, a couple of kings before the present king. But Naaman had a problem, folks. His problem was he had leprosy. And in Syria, they didn't shun lepers like they do in Israel. And Naaman had taken captive during one of these raids a little maiden, the Bible says maiden, which is a preteen, a pre-adolescent young girl who he took to serve his wife, to wait on her and to serve her. And this young girl in this account of the healing of Naaman said, if only my master would see the prophet, she's talking to the wife, who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Now let me just stop here a minute. Here is a pre-adolescent teenager, a young girl that has been enslaved and is now captive in a foreign land. 
And yet she had the audacity to speak up to the general's wife and to testify of a prophet in Israel that could heal leprosy. And it was so powerful, the words that she said, and so persuasive that it moved this general's wife to talk to the general himself. Here this young girl, this, adoles this adolescent girl, has opened up hope in a house of evil. Has opened up hope for healing. The possibility of a healing. And it wasn't for the covenant people of God. It was for the enemies that had come against the state of Israel. It was from a girl that was held as a slave, as a captive. And she was speaking to a people that did not know God, had never considered God, was worshiping other idols, and yet she was holding up hope in front of these people. Can I tell you today, the goodness of God is offered to whosoever will. The goodness of God is offered to you today for whatever you need. I wonder what this nameless child said. And as I read the Bible, there are names in there that are about that long that when I try to pronounce them, I butcher them so bad, it's probably unrecognizable. And they're only mentioned once in a book that is forever written, that will never change. And yet this young girl that has no name, we don't even know who she was, she said words so powerful, it literally changed not one nation, but two nations. And I hope when I get to eternity, if there is testimonies in heaven, I'm not sure there will be. I kind of wonder what the use of it is is when you're already in glory. But I do would like to hear what was said so powerful by this pre-teenage girl that moved nations. Never underestimate the power of God. Never underestimate the words that God's put in your mouth. Never underestimate, no matter how small you see yourself, look at this pre-teenage slave girl. It doesn't matter how insignificant you feel compared to others or how young you are or how old you are. God can use a vessel to bring hope, to speak words, to speak salvation, to bring healing and deliverance through whoever. And don't think for a minute that the words you say are just for that one person. The words that this girl spoke was not only for the wife of Naaman, but those same words echoed in the ears of the general. And then those words echoed in the ears of the general's king in Syria, Benadad too. And then those words echoed in the king of Israel, Joram. Those words echoed throughout literally and shook the nations. So don't think for a minute that your words are insignificant. The words that God speaks through you goes on and it's like a domino effect that affects a multitude of people that you don't even know. You may think that you're insignificant. You may think that you're inadequate. But I can tell you, God uses and tends to pick the least among us to bring the greatest through, the greatest victories. If you don't ask me, just ask Gideon. And he will tell you, the least of the least of his own tribe. And God will use you in these last days as his spirit is moving to speak words so powerful, it will change destinies and it will change eternities. Now Naaman's wife, heard what this girl said to her and related it to the general. And the general was so moved and hope arose so much in him that he went to the king, his king, 
and he asked him to, to send him to Israel. And the king sat down and he wrote a letter. And in that letter he said, I am sending Naaman to you, talking to the king of Israel, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And then he added 6,000 pieces of gold and 10 talents of silver and 10 talents of raiment. And he sent this general off with a parade of people heading to Israel. Some trip of about 150 miles. Apparently, this was a time between the fighting of the nations. It was a time of tense peace. And he gathered his entourage. And as the story goes on in 2 Kings chapter 5, he comes to the king Joram of Israel, and he presents the letter to him. And the king of Israel looks at this general who had been fighting and taking and pillaging his country, and he reads it. And it says, I'm sending Naaman to you that you may heal him of his leprosy. The king rent his clothes. And he turned and said, am I God that can kill and bring back to life? Why did you send this man to me to heal his leprosy? Are you trying to start a war with me? I want you to contrast the difference between the king of Israel and a young pre-teenager held in captivity as a slave. Look at the faith difference between the two. A young maiden girl that boldly stood up and spoke truth to power. And then another man that had all the power, that coward, who was supposed to be the most faithful, the one that was protecting the oracles of God, the one that had the oil of anointing poured over him, the one that had the counsel and wisdom of all the prophets, of all the scribes there, who had no faith. Well, you know the story. Elijah. You know, prophets seem to know a lot. I remember Sid's dad, a man of God. You get around him, he would read your mail. I know he's read mine a few times. I remember one time coming late to Bible study. This was back in the early 90s. And walked into church and the Bible study was already going on. And the preacher, pastor was up there and he was speaking in tongues and operating in the gifts of the Spirit. And he looked at me and said, Doctor, what you heard today is not for you. He didn't know that I had been in a meeting with two hospital CEOs that were trying to use me to merge the two institutions together, a multi-million dollar deal. And he said, it's not for you. You know, when you're open to the Spirit of God, He will let you know things. And right now the Spirit of God is moving upon the earth in a ways that we don't understand or even can comprehend. And I believe he's got every answer for every problem, every need that we have if we just listen to him. Well, Elijah got word, knew that Naaman was coming. So he sent to the king and said, don't worry about this king. Just send him over to my place. And I'll take care of it. Well, the king sent him to Elijah's house. Now, I want you to imagine right now this entourage of servants, of soldiers, of donkeys and camels and chariots and carts pulling up to a little house in Samaria. And this general in all his regalia, he gets off and he goes up full of pride, pompous, and he stands at the door of Elijah. Maybe he knocks. Maybe it's so loud out there they know his presence is there. And he stands. And he stands. And he stands. 
And finally, a little servant, probably Jehazi, comes and opens the door, looks out at him, and said, the prophet said, go down and dip in the Jordan seven times and you'll be healed, and closes the door. (laughs) Can you imagine the fury in this general, the insult that was in his heart, the offense that he had, as he had dried, as he had come at least 150 miles from Damascus, all the way to Samaria. As he was standing there at the door, ready to be healed, ready for somebody to come out, and the prophet of God doesn't even acknowledge his presence. Can you imagine the anger that was within him? I bet he felt foolish. You know, sometimes God makes our flesh feel foolish sometimes. And so here this general, that had come all this way, he turns around and he's so angry, I believe he's kicking the chariot wheels, fussing and ranting and raving about what's going on. And then the servants talk to him. And they just simply say, what we said at the very beginning. My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he said to thee, wash and be clean. Wash and be clean. You see, Naaman was expecting the prophet to come out and go through some ritual, go through something where he would come and he would call on the name of the Lord and they'd have a ritual, maybe sacrifices, and he would come and he'd lay his hand on the leprosy and the heavens would open up and fire would fall and something miraculous would happen. But all he said was, through a servant, through the crack in the door, go down to the river and wash seven times and you'll be clean. This general was ignored, he was insulted. And he didn't get his hands laid on him. But whatever that servant said to him, once again, an unnamed servant. I want to be a servant in the kingdom of heaven. I want to be a servant that God can use to say something to somebody that will change their eternity, change their destiny, change the sickness and the healing, change and put somebody on a new direction that will bring repentance. This servant finally got through to him. Just go down and dip seven times. It's not a great thing. It's not a big thing that you're asking to do. He didn't ask you to climb the highest mountain. He didn't ask you to go down to Egypt and find some obscure balm to rub on your skin. He didn't ask you to ride a camel through the desert. He just asked you to do a simple thing. You know, God just asks us, Pastor, just to do the simple things. He doesn't expect us. God does not expect us to do great things. But what he does expect us to do is to believe and to press forward in his word. Well, this servant said words so great that it changed a man of wrath and anger into a man that considered and started believing. Now, understand something. The Jordan River is about 50 miles from Samaria. So it wasn't him going down to the block and jumping in the river. He had to travel another day's or few days journey to even get to the Jordan River. And he even said, wait a minute, we got a couple of rivers in Damascus that are a lot better than this river. He was trying to dip him in the river that ultimately the Son of God would be baptized in. Prophetic cleansing. 
of the soul and of the body. God doesn't expect us to do a great thing. He just wanted Naaman to go dip in the river. But let me tell you, as a physician, and I see people with horrendous disease, and too often we pay too much attention to the diagnosis and the prognosis more than we do to the one that heals all sickness and disease. As Rob was telling you, Pastor Rob was, I was diagnosed with a terminal disease 27 years ago called mantle cell lymphoma. The prognosis was dismal. Chemo didn't cure this. Bone marrow transplants did not cure this. Stem cell harvesting transplants didn't cure this. We were given literally at the time of diagnosis a few months to live. And medical science had reached its limits. And the science of man, as great as it is, it was limited, and science left me hopeless. But I had a word from the Lord. But I had read in 1 Peter 2 and 24, who his own self by our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead unto sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes she were healed. You see, I believed in Psalms 23. And let's say it together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see, I had a word from God. I had found a word of God in the eternal scriptures that I could hold on to that would bring me hope. You see, I believed in Psalm 16, 11. That will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. This word of God brings me hope. It brings me strength. It helps me to overcome everything that is facing me. It builds up my belief, my faith. And faith arose in the presence of the Lord. Even though science had placed a death sentence on me, the Word of God placed a sentence of life on me. Psalms 118.17 says, I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. And let me tell you today, is his word not true? Here, 27 years ago, I'm in Oldsmar, Florida, declaring the works of the Lord. I stand here as a work of the Lord in front of you. Naaman had his fit. Naaman had his fit, and he was upset about not getting healed the way he wanted. How many of us have been there? Amen? For a year, I said, Lord, I've got a suggestion for you. I'm a doctor, and you can activate the immune system and target a specific antigen on every cell of that tumor. And I know, Lord, by you doing that, it would wipe it out. Well, if you don't want to do it this way, how about this way, Lord? Let me tell you, his ways are greater than our ways. His understanding is greater than our understanding. Naaman had a fit that he didn't get it healed the way he wanted to. And when he came out of there, he could have rebuffed his servants. 
when they looked at him and said, why don't you just go down and dip? Why don't you just go down and dip seven times? It's not a hard thing to do. He could have rebuffed them. He could have returned to Syria, and he would have gotten sicker and sicker and ultimately died. He would have left his family, left his command, and he left his healing behind if he did that. I don't want any of us to leave our healing behind. I don't want us to, any of us in our own carnality to leave the blessings of God behind us. But I tell you what, when you don't follow the ways of God, you will leave blessings behind. You will leave blessings behind. When you don't draw, respond to the Spirit of God drawing you even today, you will leave blessings behind that the Lord has for you. Naaman had to repent. And repent means go a different direction. He had to repent from his anger and what he thought to go into the direction of God. He had to turn away from his understanding into the instruction of God. A few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to hear a young pastor. And he said something that struck a chord in me. He said, your direction, not your desire, determines your destiny. Your direction, not your desire, determines your, direct, your destiny. This man Naaman had a desire to be healed or he wouldn't even come to Israel. But his direction, not his desire, ultimately determined his destiny. And he was almost thrown off course had it not been for that unnamed servant. Now many of us have dreams and desires and wants. And folks, I'll just tell you, they will remain dreams, desires, and wants until your direction is headed towards them. Because your direction, not your desire, not your dreams, not your wants, determines your destiny. Well, what determines your direction? It's really quite simple, folks. It's your belief. It's what you believe in your heart. It's what you believe in your innermost being that determines your direction. So your belief determines your direction. And your direction, not your desire, will determine your destiny. So I ask you today, what do you believe in? What do you believe in? You see, I believe in the Word of God. And I tell you what, I believe John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believed in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, I believe in that. And it determines my destiny. I believe that God loves me. And I believe that the Lord wants to help me in every situation that I am. Either physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, no matter what problem that I face. You see, I believe in Isaiah 41 and 11. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. I believe he's always with me. I believe that I can feel for him and he's nigh unto me. I believe that. I believe that I don't have to be dismayed. And I believe he is my God. And he said, I'll strengthen thee. I'll help thee. I'll uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. You see, I believe in Proverbs 3 and 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to your own understanding. But in all thy ways acknowledge him. And he will direct your steps, your path. I believe that. I believe that. I believe Psalm 1611, that he will show me the path of life. I believe that in his presence is fullness of joy, and that at his right hand he's got pleasures forevermore. Folks, I want you to understand these are not just words. These are power. These are forever established. These are things that penetrate into our soul and our being, 
and it changes our belief. And our belief changes our direction. And our direction is where our destiny is. But all we have to do is believe. Do you remember the Gadarene demoniac? Mark chapter 5. That's one of my favorite chapters. The Gadarene demoniac, after Jesus delivered him, he had to come back across the Sea of Galilee to the same side, to the other side where he had left from. And when he stepped off the boat, there was a ruler that came and met him there. He was a ruler of the synagogue, local church there, so to say. And he looked at Jesus and said, I'm glad you're here, Jesus. My daughter is lying at death's door. I want you to come and heal her. You see, he had faith. He believed in the power of God. He believed in the word that was made flesh and was walking among them. And you know the story. It's Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue. They were walking along with Jesus. And the woman with the issue of blood, there's yet another unnamed person. The woman with the issue of blood interrupted them. And after she was healed, then they were standing there looking at this miraculous healing of this woman. And here comes somebody from the house, and he whispers into Jairus' ear, ear, trouble the master no more. Your daughter's done past. She's dead. Jesus heard it. It's Jairus and him were standing there in that crowd. And he flipped him around, looked him in the eyeballs, and said, Be not afraid. Only believe. Only believe. I believe Jesus is looking some people in the face right now as they are trying to figure out some things. What to do? How to handle sickness? How am I going to do this? He's saying, don't be afraid, folks. I just want you to believe. Believe in him and believe in his words. Believe in the things because your belief determines your direction. And your direction determines your destiny. Believe in the things of God. You see, I believe God is not confined to the laws of nature. He proved this when he walked on the water. And he also is not confined to what he can give us. As Peter walked on the water, the only other man that has walked on the, and defied the laws of gravity. I believe that God works in dimensions of space and time beyond our capability of even understanding. And he's not subject to the laws of nature of this world. And I believe it's our belief and our faith in him that propels him to do these things and is attracting the presence of God. But all we have to do is believe. All you have to do today is believe. And believe that God is able to forgive all of your sins. To wash them away and to save you. To believe God is able to heal every disease. I don't care how far, how bad, how long it's been there. I believe He's able. I believe God restores completely. He didn't leave me as a skeleton of a man that had been ravaged by cancer. But he restored every aspect of my life even greater than ever before. And I believe God delivers. He'll deliver you from a depression, from whatever addiction that may be on your life. And I believe God has a path of life, a destiny for you to walk on. When you hold by his hand and by his ways, he will walk you right into that destiny. I don't know, Carlos, could you ever get that video running? Go ahead and show this. And this is me and everything that you're seeing on this video. And while it's playing, I'll ask for the singers and the musicians to come. But everything that you see on here is original footage of what the Lord brought me through.
how he's treating me. And I want your faith to rise. All you have to do is believe in him. Believe in him. Go ahead, Carlos. Healing is here.
said as he was preaching in the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth he said you know there were many lepers in the time of Elijah mm. but only one was healed yeah yeah then he looked at him he said if thou canst believe yeah all things are possible Come on. to him that believeth. We believe God. And I believe God today. Thank you, Jesus. And at the beginning of service, I was asking the Lord, who are you going to save today, God? Whose destiny is forever going to be changed? Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Who are you going to heal today, Lord? Praise How many God. will you heal today? Come on. How many will you restore? Thank you, Jesus. And breathe your breath of life in them once again. Thank you, Jesus. Who are you going to deliver today, Lord? Deliver them, Lord. Come on. Deliver them. Come on. Come on. The Spirit of God is moving. Today in this place, and in your heart, don't try to rationalize it away. That's right. That's right. Respond to the Spirit of God. He will change your destiny, and He's got blessings for you laid out right here that you can have. Amen. Back. Amen. Praise God. Stay here. Listen, this is what the church of Jesus Christ has got to get back to. We get excited because this is exceptional. Jesus said this was meant to be normal. That's right. All the time. The first thing I want to do is challenge you. If you have never asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart, he's still alive. He's real. The God of heaven and earth actually wants to live inside of your life. Religion can't do that. But a relationship with God will change everything. If you have never asked Jesus Christ into your heart, or if you did some time back and you've walked away from God, today is the time. Today is the time. Today is the time to say yes to Jesus Christ. A simple prayer of, God, forgive me. Come into my life. Jesus, I accept you right now. Every eye closed. Would you close your eyes right across this auditorium? Those of you that are watching on live stream, today is the time. If you want to ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart, come on, raise your hand while every eye is closed. Put your hand up. I see that hand up the back. I see that hand, sir. I see this young man up the front here. Come on, you can put your hand down. Who else wants to accept Jesus today as their Lord and Savior? Ask Jesus to come into your life. Thank you, Jesus. That's awesome. About three, four hands have been raised so far this morning. Come on, church, put your hands together. How awesome. Thank you, God. I want to encourage everyone to repeat this prayer, but if you raised your hand, this prayer is especially for you. It's not a magical prayer, but it works wonders. Why? Because anyone who is sincere and who calls out to God and says, God, I want you, God will always show up. When you want God, God will show up. 
So I'm going to invite those of you especially who raised your hand and everyone in this church, repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God I, believe, I, believe, I, believe, I believe you love me. You love me. I don't know why, but I'm glad you do. I'm glad you do. Father, Father, thank you, thank you for, sending Jesus Christ for sending Jesus Christ to die for my mistakes, to die for my sin on that cross. Jesus Christ, I recognize that you are God come in the flesh and you died for me. And today, Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. Live inside of me. Forgive me of all my sins. Speak to me. Walk with me. Talk to me. Live with me. I accept you, Jesus Christ, as my Lord and Savior today. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Come on, church. Put your heads together. Those of you who have asked Jesus Christ into your heart today, that is the greatest, the single biggest decision. In fact, that is more miraculous than the miracle you just saw on the screen. The saving of a soul. God loves you so much, he would go to the Jordan and back, and to the Jordan and back again just to save you, just to win you. We run a discipleship class here every Sunday. You don't have to wait for lesson one. We designed it so that you could jump in at any point. If you can stay today and join us for lunch, the class is in operation in this room next door. If you are not prepared for today, but you raised your hand, I want to say go beyond raising your hand. Get involved in the discipleship class. Let us teach you the foundations that Jesus taught his disciples. Let's make this relationship go deep. Let's make sure that this relationship will go through your lifetime. I am so proud of you today for asking Christ in your heart. Church, aren't you excited? Another four people ask Jesus in their lives today. That is awesome, fantastic, tremendous. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to close this part of the service, but if you want to hang out in the presence of God, we're going to just worship. If you need prayer for a miracle, come on down the front. Push your, your way in front of the worshipers. You're, you're free to go, and you're free to stay. We welcome you. Uh, we thank you for being here with us. If you must go, that's fine. The service is officially released. I won't say over. Released. But if you want to worship, come on down the front. If you need prayer for a miracle, come on down the front. God bless you. How many of you appreciated this message today? I'd like to say one more thing. Your belief will determine your direction. And your direction is going to determine your destiny. over every man and woman in this house. Holy Spirit, we want a move of God. I don't want to do church. I want to do a move of your spirit. We pour your blessing out on people as they leave, whenever that is. We pray and release your blessing on this altar in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Lead us in worship, Pastor.